go. So hello everyone and welcome to the IPC seminar. So before introducing the speaker, I would like to invite, invite you all to uh, present your works and ideas at IPC seminars and just uh, contact me and Mikule and we will discuss how we can organize a session. So uh, today, uh, our speaker is Eleftheria Makri. Uh, Eleftheria is a security lecturer and researcher at Saxion University of Applied Sciences. And also, she is a research assistant at CASIC at KU Leuven. And her research is mostly about areas in applied cryptography and privacy enhancing technologies. And today, uh, she will talk about the return of Rattlesden and secure generation of RSA modules using distribu distributed sewings. And if you have any questions, you can post on the chat, on the Twitter, I guess, and ask at the end of the talk. So, Elefteria, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, as you already said, today I will uh, discuss with you the latest uh, work um, we did with Cyprian, uh, Dragos and uh, Titwan entitled, uh, with a very long title, The Return of Eratosthenes, Secure Generation of RSA Moduli Using Distributed Sieving. So, given the title already, I would like to start with that and uh, break it down into smaller pieces. So, um, let's start with generation of RSA moduli. An RSA modulus, modulus, also known as a biprime, is the product of uh, two prime numbers. We usually know it by capital N, and we want to keep the secret pi prime factors, uh, oh, we want to keep, sorry, the prime factors secret. We usually denote those by P and Q. Um, this kind of uh, biprimes are uh, essentially the basis of the RSA crypto system, the first public key crypto system, and many more that followed after that. And uh, uh, their security is based on the factoring assumption. assumption. So, given a public capital N, we uh, uh, we know that it's difficult to find the prime factors P and Q. So that's the. Uh, uh, RSA modulus uh, part of the title, and we need to generate those if we want to do um, RSA-based public key cryptography. So um, the next part uh, in the title is about secure generation of these moduli or distributed technologies. Um, so let's see how we add security on top of that. Uh, we do this by means of uh, multi-party computation. And for those not familiar with the technologies, uh, multi-party computation allows a set of mutually distrusting parties to compute a function over their private inputs. So in, in this example on the slide, we have five parties, they have five different inputs. And the goal of the protocol here is to uh, securely compute F and on these private inputs. And by securely, we mean that the parties at the end of the protocol learn the output of the function and nothing more about the inputs of the other parties. So, um, of course, beyond what can be inferred by the output itself combined with your own input. So that's where uh, security comes into play. Despite the fact that you're running the protocol together, you don't learn anything about the inputs of the other parties. Um, so uh, let's uh, continue with the title. Uh, the next part is about sieving. More precisely, we look into distributed sieving in this work. Um, so to find these primes and uh, combine them into the biprime N, um, the most straightforward way to do so would be trial division. But remember that if we want to do this in a distributed ma manner, P and Q are secret, and then trial division is, is not possible. It's, it's not possible to be done efficiently, at least. So how do we overcome this problem? Um, uh, this, by the way, this part is also part of our protocol, is inspired by an older work of uh, Malkin and others, 
And you may find it also in the rit- literature as construct- constructive sampling. Distributed sieving or constructive sampling are also used in our uh, paper interchangeably. So um, how can we find P and Q that, are ha- that have higher chances of being prime without doing trial division? Well, this is where the distributed sieving comes uh, into play. So we set a sieving bound up to which uh, we want to make sure that uh, there are no uh, prime factors, the same as we would have done with a trial division bound. And then we set uh, uh, what we call M sample in our protocol to be the product of all odd primes up to that bound. And then when the parties in our multi-party protocol select their shares for uh, as the contrib- their contribution for P and Q, they select it in, in such a way that they are relatively prime to, uh, to M sample. So this means that also the product of these shares will also be relatively uh, prime to M sample. So the first step in our protocol, I will get later on into a more step-by-step uh, explanation, but the first step of our protocol is based on this distributed sieving and it's based on multiplicative shares so that this helps us make sure that up to M sample, the P and Q that are collaboratively um, sampled uh, have no small prime factors. And the last part uh, of the title, the spicing up, so to say, the return of Eratosthenes is due to uh, Eratosthenes and a particular the sieve of Eratosthenes, which is um, an ancient algorithm to find uh, prime numbers up to a certain bound, which is, by the way, uh, Eratosthenes is a Greek uh, mathematician. So why do we care about RSA moduli and why do we want to do them in a distributed manner, right? So originally when we came up with uh, public key cryptography, the assumption was that there is a trusted third party that um, produces these primes P and Q and their product uh, N. But there are certain scenarios where we cannot entrust it a third party to do this job. So we want to do this in a distributed manner. So the most uh, straightforward example of uh, such a situation is threshold cryptography. So when we want uh, parties um, to be able to um, decrypt collaboratively without any of the parties to have the whole private key of the of the crypto system, uh, we need to have a way to um, to uh, produce, to generate this RSA moduli in a, in a distributed manner. So this is where the whole uh, study started of the um, secure generation of RSA moduli. And it dates back to 1997 from the seminal work of uh, Bonnet and Franklin. Nowadays, interest in this kind of problem is revived. Uh, especially last year, uh, we had uh, two works um, that are trying to solve the same problem as well. And this is because we have new kinds of applications like permission, uh, permissionless consensus protocol in blockchain or verifiable delay functions. And all these needed parts of, the pro- of the, these protocols, we need to have a distributed RSA uh, modulus generation. And this kind of technologies are interesting beyond uh, academia because we already have um, companies like Ligero or Unbound that offer um, multi-party computation technologies to the public and um, this this would be one of the problems that they, they try to address. So as I mentioned already, the uh, problem dates dates back to uh, ni- or the first solution to the problem, so to say, dates back to 1997, uh, where Bonnet and Franklin devised a passive protocol in the dishonest majority setting for three or more parties, and uh, this test uh, is based on biprimality testing. So we see in the table uh, several related works and regarding the type of testing, we see two exceptions that do primality testing, while the rest of the works uh, do it based on biprimality. Now, what's what's the difference here? Uh, The difference is that with biprimality, 
the public n that we are trying to compute, so this by prime, can be used so that all the computations, all the modular operations happen over this public value. So that helps in terms of efficiency. The downside of biprimality is that we need to sample two uh, prime numbers simultaneously. So n has to be a prime, by prime means that p and q have to be sampled at the same, have to be prime and sampled at the same time. So this increases the number of repetitions, so to say, until we hit two primes at the same time. Now, uh, well, the inverse essentially is the um, pros and cons of the primality testing. With primality testing, we check P and Q separately, so the odds of hitting primes are higher, but then all the computations around them have to happen over a secret modulus, and that's what makes this kind of works less efficient. So... There, there was some interest on the um, distributed generation of RSA moduli problem around the work of Bonnet and Franklin. Then we had a little pause in the meantime. And now with all these blockchain applications, the, uh, um, the interest in the problem is revived. And we see there are in the table, there are protocols for two parties. There are protocols for general multi-party computation. We see two exceptions that have a small leakage. In terms of security, uh, that's okay to leak a few bits of the prime numbers due to the um, uh, factoring assumption. But on the other hand, they allow some kind of selective failure attacks on these protocols, uh, which may essentially slow down the whole process. Um, so our work uh, is secure in the active security model for dishonest majorities, for general and party computation. It's based, like most of the related work, on the Bonin franklin blueprint, so on biprimality testing. And um, we will mostly compare our work with uh, one of the two protocols of last year from Chen and others that was presented in uh, crypto last year. Uh, because we share the same uh, security model. Now, there is uh, a second work of last year, again from Chen and others, that's called Diogenes, it, and it works in a special model, the semi-honest coordinator uh, model. So they assume that there are small resources or relatively low resources parties that uh, where the the, there is active security in the uh, full threshold setting. But uh, there is also a special party, the coordinator, who is semi-honest. So he's trusted to do some um, um, homomorphic computations and relay messages to the other parties. So that's why our comparison focuses on the other work that this is in exactly the same security model as ours. So let's see what uh, we bring to the table. Um, First of all, our protocol uh, works with generic MPC, so uh, we can instantiate it with any um, MPC technology that's based on uh, linear secret sharing. Uh, then um, we have this uh, distributed sieving or construct constructive sampling uh, phase, and um, well, we, we sample first multiplicative sharings, then we perform a multiplication to transform them to additive sharings, and this multiplication allows additive errors, but this, this happens in a way that does not degrade the overall security of the protocol. So essentially, we increase efficiency in that step without uh, losing the active, overall active security of the protocol. Then um, we have a biprimality testing that's based on a, on a Jacobi test. And uh, the consistency check that again adds the active security for this part of the protocol comes only if the test passes. So that again adds into the um, efficiency of the protocol. And at some, we have several sub-protocols. Some of them I will discuss when we go a bit on a more step-by-step explanation of the protocol, but one of the mo most interesting ones is that we can convert additive shares over, uh, over a particular modulus to additive shares over the integers. And we think that this protocol can be of independent interest. So there are already some uh, candidates that we, um, we mentioned in our paper that could um, benefit from such a protocol. Last but not least, our uh, protocol is uh, more communi 
education efficient than the work of Chen and others that I mentioned in the related work overview table. So let me introduce the uh, famous Bonin Franklin bl blueprint. It's just uh, three steps. So first we pick prime candidates and the original work does, that's done um, uh, via trial division. Then we perform the secure multiplication of P and Q, and then uh, we do a biprimality testing of, um, of N, of the capital N, the, the product. So our protocol follows closely the, uh, the blueprint of Bonin Franklin, only that uh, the biprimality testing, we split it for uh, reasons of security proofs and functionality expressions, we split it into three steps, also because it adds uh, active security on, on top of the Bonin Franklin protocol. So the first step is the same, we sample P and Q, but instead of trial division, we do it with a distributed sieving that I explained before. Uh, then we perform the secure uh, multiplication and then uh, we split the biprimality in three steps. First, the, first the Jacobi test, then uh, the consistency check that confirms that the shares input in this Jacobi biprimality testing are, uh, is indeed guaranteed, and finally a GCD test. So let's look at the interesting parts of each of these five steps. So we start with sampling. Uh, as I said, we sample multiplicative shares for uh, increasing our chances of P and Q being uh, uh, primes. And for efficiency reasons, we multiply these shares to create additive shares in a semi-honest fashion. So the parties are allowed to insert additive errors into these shares. Now, in our setting, this is allowed because the product will later, the product N will later be open, so uh, we can check that it, um, it 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 is within the bounds that we have preset, and uh, that it is uh, co-prime co with this M sample that uh, I discussed earlier with the distributed sieving. After we have these additive shares, uh, we input them in what we call MPC CRT engines. And let me explain a little bit more about this MPC CRT engines. So uh, CRT stands for Chinese Remainder Theorem in this, uh, in this case. And while traditionally we have one MPC engine working as an arithmetic black box over Zn with inputs and outputs in Zn, um, now we split the problem into smaller problems where n is the product of um, several primes and we have smaller MPC engines that operate over smaller space. Um, and um, well, they work all these MPC engines, they work in parallel. Inputs and outputs are in these smaller subspaces and in the end by exploiting the properties of the Chinese remainder theorem, we can reconstruct uh, the output over the larger um, uh, arithmetic modulus. Now, this increases uh, significantly the efficiency of the protocol, and it's a technique that was also used in the two prior works uh, solving the same problem in 2020, Diogenes and the, um, the crypto paper from uh, Chen and others. So the second part of our protocol is what we call the combined step. So essentially computing the product between P and Q and reveal the outcome. Um, the first thing we need to do is to extend the CRT uh, representation of P and Q. Um, most of the computations uh, in this protocol have to happen over the integers, so we need to prevent overflows, and that's why we need the CRT extension, which in this first step, because we are inserting for the first time authenticated shares of the parties, can happen locally, so every party takes their local integer sharing and they input it into just a larger number of uh, CRT, uh, MPC CRT engines. While later on we will see when we have authenticated shares for the next steps of our protocol, then um, we have a small sub protocol that does the, what we call level up, extending the CRT representation. So first we extend so that we don't have overflows. Then we do, over this extended CRT representation, we do the standard secure multiplication 
uh, MPC multiplication, and then we open the result. And uh, by checking that um, the result falls within the predetermined bounds and it's co-prime to M sample, we also guarantee that the preview step in the sampling, there were no additive errors um, inserted by the parties. So next step is the, uh, the Jacobi testing. First, we sample a, a value that we call gamma in our protocols, and it has to have a Jacobi symbol uh, with n equal to 1. Uh, we compute uh, phi of n over 4 in the exponent of gamma, and then we check if this value is equal to plus or minus 1. Uh, if not, we abort the protocol. Now, uh, this kind of Jacobi biprimality testing has uh, probability half of introducing, uh, accepting false positives. So to increase the probability that N is a biprime, we repeat the test sec times. Um, again, in this step, uh, we haven't checked the consistency of the party's share, shares. So there is the, the, here is the follow-up step, uh, the consistency check which uh, does exactly that. Now, again, here, um, we increase the efficiency of the protocol by postponing this consistency check only if the Jacobi biprimality testing passes. Um, here comes the level up protocol that I uh, mentioned already to extend the CRT representation of these authenticated shares so that again, we don't have overflows because um, we will have again multiplications and masking happening uh, over these uh, secret exponents. So we will need a larger space to ensure that there is no uh, overflow happening. Uh, we have devised another sub protocol. I won't get into the details of that, that samples bounded randomness. And by using this bounded randomness, we uh, multiplicatively mask the secret exponent. And then we have another protocol that I will uh, get into the details of that converts CRT sharings into sharings over the integers. Uh, the rest of this protocol, by the way, is only broadcasts and reproducing the Jacobi test. So I'm not getting into any further details. I will uh, only focus on the, this conversion to integer protocol. So the first step of this conversion to integer protocol is to sample um, randomness that uh, bounded randomness that lives in two spaces at the same time. The, we have the CRT representation of the randomness, and we also have a sharing of the, the same value over the integers. So as you see on the slide, each party holds a sh two sharings, uh, two shares, sorry, one of the CRT representation of the randomness and one uh, of the randomness over the integers. So using this randomness, we mask the value we want to convert. Um, in this example, I call the value x. We want to convert this x from the CRT representation to a representation of a sharing over the integers. So we additively mask them. So every party now holds uh, a temporary value of the um, masked based on the CRT randomness, a masked value of x. So we can uh, securely open this without revealing any information about the uh, input X. So everybody, now every party holds uh, the, the clear text value T. And then by simply subtracting the uh, integer version of the randomness at locally by each party, they uh, construct the, their own integer share of the, um, of the value. So here comes the conversion from the X into CRT representation. Now uh, every party holds a share of the X into uh, representation over the integers. The last uh, step of our protocol is a, a GCD test. Um, I'm not getting into the details of that because it just um, repeats uh, similar techniques, we just need to extend again carefully our uh, space so that we don't have overflows, level up, and uh, that's why I'm not getting into the details. Only interesting maybe to say is that the GCD test uh, is important um, to be introduced because there is a certain type of um, biprimes that um, pass 
sorry, a certain type of non-bi primes that pass the Jacobi test and the GCD test is there to catch those exceptions. So let me get into the efficiency analysis of our, uh, of our protocol. So uh, we try to estimate the communication cost uh, and we did it for a two party execution and a 16 party execution for different uh, sizes of primes. So uh, where Kappa is 1024 bits, 1536 or 2048. And um, this was just to follow the same example as the work of uh, Chen and others, so that we have a, a clear comparison. So, um, as you can see, for two-party semi-honest execution of our protocol, uh, we have about uh, 41 uh, megabytes communication cost per party for 1,024-bit primes, and up to 243 megabytes for uh, 2048 bit primes and uh, that's uh, let me check that's yeah three to three to four times um, three to four times more efficient than uh, the, the previous work and then for um, malicious security we reach up to a factor of uh, 37 improvement but again you see that the communication cost uh, re reaches up to almost two gigabytes um, for per party and then we did the same kind of experiment for uh, 16 parties here we see that for the semi-honest uh, execution, the protocol of uh, Chen and others is actually more efficient than ours. While again, for uh, malicious security, uh, we, we, um, we perform better even for the 16 party case, um, up to a factor of 30 or so. So let me uh, summarize uh, the contribution of our work. So one of the interesting characteristics characteristic of our uh, protocol is that it can be implemented based on different MPC technologies as long as they are based on linear secret sharing. Um, that's uh, a benefit also because if the particular scenario at hand needs uh, doesn't need active security or doesn't need to be in the dishonest majority setting, then you can uh, use more efficient constructions or more standard constructions like Samir secret sharing. Um, then we did our best to exploit all the kind of public information like um, the buy prime in this case so that we can do as many parts of the protocol semi-honestly without degrading the overall security or postponing the, um, the check of, uh, of, of the malicious security to a later point, only if certain repetitions, for example, um, uh, go through or uh, certain tests go through. Uh, we have, amongst other, other sub-protocols, uh, we, we suggest the conversion to integer sub-protocol, which is of independent interest. And as I explained with the previous table, tables, um, our work uh, reaches up to 37, uh, a factor of 37 better communication cost compared to uh, the work of last year. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to take your questions. So thank you, Eleftheria, for your great talk. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, so I don't see any questions in the chat nor in the Twitter, uh, but I have a question. So uh, uh, how interesting is your portable is to the industry? I mean, the communication cost seems to be like, at least for me, a little bit large for the industry to be practical. So I'm wondering that if you present this to the industry people and what were their feedback to you? And also, how do you think that you can improve the uh, weaknesses uh, about the efficiency of the protocol? Yeah, so that's a that's a very interesting question indeed, because as you saw for uh, 
for malicious security, you, we read to terms of gigabytes of communication cost per party. So uh, if I have to give a black or white answer at this point, this is not yet industry ready. Uh, however, as I said, uh, there are the, the interesting part is that you can uh, use other kinds of security models and then the efficiency immediately follows. Uh, so that's that's one of the positive parts. And uh, if you want to look at um, industry ready protocols for this kind of difficult problems, you have to somehow compromise on security. So we have uh, this uh, Diogenes protocol that I mentioned also in the related work. They reached uh, thousands of uh, parties and good communication costs, but they are in this coordinator model. So one of the parties has superpowers and is also trusted to do some homomorphic operations and relay messages. And that, of course, uh, helps a lot with the efficiency. So you have to somehow, at this point, for so difficult problems, you have to somehow meet in the middle for uh, industry-ready products. Uh, I see. I'm also wondering if there are other uh, efficiency measures other than the communication cost that is interesting in this uh, context. I mean, like the, the, the time and everything that the clients have to spend to compute their shares or whatever. Yeah, so uh, definitely that's an interesting measure as well, but we did not implement the full protocol and that's why we don't have uh, this these numbers. So we wanted to indeed compare in the same setting with exactly what's been done last year, but it was exactly the same case. So there was no implementation and there was a concrete estimation of the communication cost and we, we just stick to the same scenario. But definitely runtimes are also an important metric. I see, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, so again, thank you, Eleftheria, for your great talk. I would also like to again invite everyone to present their works here and ideas. And if, Mikhail, you have something to say. I would say uh, uh, maybe we went a little bit fast. There's I'm sure any more questions from the audience. Uh, because I see some cameras enabled, so maybe I, some people was thinking about. Well, I just wanted to say hi to Elefteria, who, who hi. we <laughs> met each other in fact, a long time ago. So. Hi, thank you but for I, having me. Pardon me? Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming and giving the seminar. I, but I have no further question. I'm not a cryptographer. These kind of things are interesting to look from a distance from my side. So. <laughs> okay, so that's all right. And uh, as, as Myron said, again, uh, if you want to reach us uh, on Twitter, there are all the links provided for, uh, for, for reaching us uh, to submit a proposal for, uh, for uh, next seminars. So we'll be really glad to have those. Uh, and um, yeah, thanks again, Eleftheria, uh, for having us with, uh, sorry, to having you with us today as well. And uh, yeah, that's it, I guess. Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye -bye. See, you. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye.